grace, peace, and mercy to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to this service of worship here at Concord Presbyterian Church. My name is Steve Clark, and I have the privilege of being pastor here at Concord. And it's so good to be gathered together, even if right now only electronically through the gift of technology. But I always am reminded each time we do this that we are also bound together by God's Spirit, who is not limited by space or time. So it's good to be together. If you are connecting with us for the very first time in this service, I say a special word of welcome to you. If you'd like to learn more about what's going on here at Concord, you see there at the bottom of the screen, you can check out our website, send us an email, give us a phone call. Be happy to answer any questions you might have, share any information. And we do look forward to the day when once again it will be safe for us all gathered together here in person. And we hope that you can join us then, and we'll welcome you in person. And if you're up for it, we'll give you a warm, conquered handshake, or even if you'd be up for it, a warm, uh, real hug, not just a virtual one. So we are glad to be together as we begin this season of Lent, these, uh, these six weeks leading up to the celebration of the resurrection at Easter. And now as the prelude is played and the Christ candle is lit, I invite us all to take these next few moments to begin to open our spirits and our hearts and then come into the presence of the living God so we can lift up our spirits and lift up our voices in praise and worship. Join me now in our responsive call to worship. From water to wilderness, God's covenant continues. God's reign comes near. On stone and in hearts, God's covenant continues. God's reign comes near. 
from the ancestor of nations to the sun lifted up, God's covenant continues. God's reign comes near. We follow Jesus on the Lenten path, for where he is, we would be also. Let us worship the Lord. faithful to the covenant of steadfast love, even when we are unfaithful. Without fear then, trusting in God's mercy, we are free to confess our sins. So let us pray together in our responsive prayer of confession. Before you, Jesus Christ, we admit how and where we have underestimated our influence, letting our words or silences hurt abusing trust, betraying confidences. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. We admit how and where we have made a show of our religion, attracting more attention to us and less to you. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. We admit to where in our lives a vague interest has become a dangerous passion, and we are not sure what to do or whether we are even still in control. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, if we have looked or longed for an easier gospel, a lighter cross, a less demanding savior, and turn our eyes and avert our longing from what we want to choose to the one who has chosen us. Forgive our unfaithfulness and for our better living. Give us not the remedy we desire tomorrow, but the grace you offer today. Hear now our silent confession.
We ask this for your love's sake. Amen. As Noah and his family were brought safely through the flood onto dry ground, so in baptismal waters we are brought from death into new life in Christ. Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, forgives us and reconciles us and all things in heaven and on earth. Thanks be to God for this good news. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and also with you. I invite you to take these next few moments to share words or signs of peace with those around you. And if you are by yourself, to take an opportunity, whether now and hitting the pause button, or sometime later today, just to send a text or an email, make a phone call, or simply lift up someone you love in prayer and send out signs of peace. Peace be with you. And may the peace of Christ be with you. The peace of Christ be with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. The peace of Christ be with you. And, and also, also with you. you. Good morning. Today is the first Sunday in Lent. This is the beginning of the season that takes us through Easter. And it's a quiet time when we find ways to connect to God and be alone with God. And one way to do that is through prayer. You received a bag this week with some Lent family activities and in there was a Lent devotional. And today is the first day for that Lent devotional. And what we're going to do today is create a prayer space. So you can find a spot in your house, in your bedroom, but it should be a place where anyone can go from your family to be alone with God and to pray. And we even have a little sign in our devotional kit that on one says it's available one side it says available and the other side it says in use so I'm gonna put this out right now and say it's in use and that means that right now this is my space to be with God you also received a candle which is a nice way to create a quiet space and everyone got a different stone with a heart on it that you can hold or you can look at or you can even draw on it as you pray with God. So we're creating this space to be alone and I think it's important for us to remember that Jesus found times to be alone with God. We forget that Jesus traveled a lot and he didn't have a home. 
he stayed with other people he was always in a different home he was always around people people wanted to be with him but he made a point of going off by himself to be alone to connect with God and to pray and so that's what we're going to do during this time of Lent. And for today, I would like to say the prayer with you that's in your Lent devotion packet. It looks like this, and you can either listen along or you can get your prayer paper and say your prayer with me. Let's pray. Dear God, Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for his life. Thank you that he shows us how to be connected to you. Help me to learn how to be alone with you. to talk with you, to laugh with you, to cry with you, to question with you, to grow with you. Bless me with time, space, and ability to meet with you one on one this week and every week amen as we come now to the reading and proclaiming of the word i invite you to join me in prayer as we ask god through god's spirit to help us listen and to understand let us pray Gracious God, in rushing waters and in dry wilderness, in every se season and circumstance, we need your sustaining word. By the power of your Holy Spirit, proclaim the good news among us today so that we may repent and believe and see once again how the time is fulfilled and your reign has come near in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Our text for this morning comes from the New Testament Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 through 42. This is a beginning of a series that we will, uh, a series of readings, we will go all the way from now through Easter, and the readings will come from Luke's Gospel. We heard on Ash Wednesday the reading that talked about Jesus setting his face to go to Jerusalem. And it's in that chapter 9 where Luke's story pivots and Jesus who's been doing his ministry up north around Galilee mainly now heads to Jerusalem knowing full well what awaits him there and as we take on our Lenten journey we will walk with Jesus. Luke 10 25 through 42 let us listen for God's word to us today. On one occasion an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. 
So too, a Levite, when he, be he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now, as Jesus and his disciples went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. So I feel like I should start by answering the question that may be bopping around in your head, which may be, where is he? What happened to the cross and everything, <laughs> and the table and all the chairs and the choir loft? Well, as I've said many times over this past 12 months, this is the year of doing things differently. And um, the weather being what it was, uh, I managed to have enough time to get the worship service put together and then recorded in the sanctuary. Uh, before the snow started coming down Wednesday evening, but there was not enough time to get the sermon written and done and, and recorded, so I had to bring everything home with me. And so I'm here at the house and doing it here. So um, the gift of technology and just one more different thing we're doing. So thought you should know that so you weren't distracted. And um, as Paul Harvey would say, now you know the rest of the story. In Luke's Gospel, the scene that we read last week, what we typically call the transfiguration of Jesus, in Luke's telling of the story, it is soon followed by a moment in which, as Luke tells it, Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem, knowing full well what was waiting for him there. In fact, he's mentioned it twice already, and he will just right before the transfiguration and right after, and he will mention it again several times as the story continues about the arrest and uh, the execution that awaits him there. In fact, the rest of the gospel from towards the end of chapter 9 on will be about that journey toward Jerusalem and toward the completion of his ministry in a, on a cross, on Mount Golgotha, and then in an empty tomb. And in the weeks ahead, as we make our way through the season of Lent in our journey toward Holy Week and Easter, we will go with Jesus on this journey. We will listen to what he says along the way. We will watch what he does along the way. We will learn again who Jesus is and what he has done for us, and we will learn again what it means to follow Jesus as we are on the way with Jesus. Today, along the way on this journey, we heard about Jesus' conversa two conversations, one with an expert in the religious law, and another then with two sisters who welcome him into their home. The first conversation, which I will refer to as the Samaritan incident, is with this lawyer, and the lawyer has a question about life 
specifically about eternal life, which in the Bible is shorthand for life in the full presence of God for eternity. It's also life in here and now that re fully reflects God's holiness and righteousness. Now Luke tells us that in asking this question, the lawyer was in fact testing Jesus, which could mean he was just testing Jesus' orthodoxy and looking to see if Jesus would give the correct answer. But it could be that he was also at the same time actually searching and wanted to test Jesus to see if he might know something the lawyer hadn't figured out yet in spite of all of his learning and training. But Jesus turns the question back on the man as he often does with those who question him and he asks the lawyer, well, what do you think? You know, you know the law, what do you think? And the lawyer gives the correct answer about loving God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, yep, that's it. But the lawyer is smart enough to realize it's not as simple as it sounds, and so he comes up with a follow-up question. Okay, he says, but if I'm supposed to love my neighbor, who does that mean? Who is this neighbor I'm supposed to love? Which really means, who, don't I, who is it I don't have to love? Who's outside the boundary of neighbor? Which leads Jesus to telling one of probably his most familiar teaching stories, what we call the parable of the Good Samaritan, which we just heard. And in the end, the point that Jesus makes for the lawyer, as he so often does for us, is you're asking the wrong question. What he really says, if you really want to know how to live as God wants, the question you're asking shouldn't be, who is my neighbor? The question you should be asking is, how can I be a neighbor to those around me? How can I treat people like neighbors? In the parable Jesus tells, the priest who serves in God's temple in Jerusalem comes along, sees this man lying in the road, stripped and beaten, and passes by, going on with his business, whatever it is. Along comes a Levite, someone who assists the priests in God's temple in Jerusalem, and he comes along, he sees the stripped and beaten man lying in the road, and passes by, going on with his business, whatever it is. And then the Samaritan. This Samaritan, which means this is someone who believes the wrong things, who worships the wrong ways, and who would not be allowed anywhere near God's temple in Jerusalem, he comes along. He also sees the stripped and beaten man lying in the road, and he was moved with pity, or had compassion, or moved with compassion in some translations. The first two passers-by saw the man but they didn't really see him as anything more than a risk or a distraction. The Samaritan was able to see the man as a human being, someone in need, someone whose need was more important in that moment than whatever task or destination uh, the Samaritan had. All three of these are on the road because they have to get somewhere to do something, but only the Samaritan pays attention to someone who he encounters along the way. The lawyer wants a rule or principle to live by, and Jesus tells him there is no principle or rule of neighbor. There is only the person in front of you needing your love, needing your compassion. And then there is what I'll call the Martha and Mary incident. So in that scene, which follows right after Jesus tells this story. So this text, this scene is familiar to many people. And, and the message is often boiled down to, it's better to sit still and listen to Jesus than to go out and just be doing stuff all the time. Contemplation, study, prayer. Jesus is telling us that all of that is better than to be busy doing things. But we just heard Jesus tell a lawyer, go and do likewise. Go and do mercy. So if walking faithfully with God means doing something in the world, how can Jesus now say, doing isn't what really matters? 
And in fact, numerous other times in the Gospels, it will be clear that Jesus thinks doing things, doing certain things does matter. So maybe Martha's problem isn't that she's busy. Well, let's look again at what the text says. It says, Martha was distracted by her many tasks. That's how Luke describes her. And then, when Martha complains that nobody's helping her with all this work, Jesus tells her, you are worried and distracted by many things. Imagine being a guest at someone's house and your host or hostess is, is flitting about and they're serving food and drink. They're asking if you have enough. Uh, they're prodding you to get more. They're taking your plate when it's empty. They're refilling your cup when it's only half empty. But they never sit down to have conversation. Ask how you're doing. What's going on in your life right now? How are you? Maybe you've had that experience. Maybe you've been that host or hostess. <laughs> I have a friend whose mother really enjoys hosting family or friends for a meal. She loves hosting people uh, coming to be together in her house, but she has a hard time sitting down and enjoying the meal with us and simply having conversation. I remember many times being almost finished with my meal when out of the corner of my eye I see a hand reach in and grab my so far unused salad fork and march it off to the kitchen for washing. And I'm pretty sure she saw that as being hospitable. But I thought, well, I'm not done with that yet. <laughs> I wonder what Jesus would say. I wonder if he might make some comment about being worried and distracted. But what I hear Jesus uh, in Jesus' words isn't just about hospitality in our homes. I was telling the mug and muffin this uh, group this week uh, that as I was getting ready Wednesday morning uh, for the study and the conversation together and then for offering ashes in the parking lot later that afternoon and in the evening and all the other things on my to-do list including writing my sermon uh, for this day, I realized with some embarrassment that I was worried and distracted by many things as I was trying to get many things, uh, trying to get things done. Important things, of course. Important things for God, of course. Just like Martha was doing important stuff for Jesus, of course. You know, as it turns out, I was, you know, it just hit me when the irony, of course, in, in preparing to think about this text, how easy it is to get so focused on doing good things or doing the right things that we can forget why we're doing them or who we're doing them for. Has that ever happened to you? When I read these, when I first read these verses over the last couple of weeks, it seemed to me at first like the only connection between these two scenes, between the Samaritan incident and the Martha and Mary incident, the only connection was that Jesus is in both of them. But then, as, as in what I can only describe as the Spirit kind of nudging me as I was reading what others say and then thought about what was going on, and, and then even by a comment of someone uh, in Mug and Muffin, I saw what I really hadn't noticed before. What the real world Martha and the parable world priest and Levite have in common is an inability or an unwillingness to pay attention. Whatever their reason, those, two, those first two travelers in the story, those travelers on their own couldn't be bothered on, on the road, couldn't be bothered to pay attention to the stripped and beaten man lying there in front of them. They had to get on to other things. We don't know what they were. And in Jesus' telling, it doesn't matter. And Jesus says that Martha, worried and distracted as she is, needs to focus on on only one thing. And at that spot on the road between Jerusalem and Jer Jericho, it seems like the only one thing to pay attention to was a stripped and beaten man lying in the road. Which makes me wonder, what are the many things that distract me, distract you, distract us from paying attention to the, the one thing needed at the moment, whatever it is? And what if the one thing is that person standing right in front of me? Even if their need isn't as visible as it was for that man lying on the Jerusalem road. Last Sunday we saw Jesus transfigured on a mountain. But the point of that story wasn't 
what we saw, but what we heard, right? A voice thundering from out of heaven telling the disciples that this Jesus they're walking with is God's chosen son. So listen to him. Listen to him. In the first scene with the lawyer, Jesus tells us, pay attention to the needs around you and respond with compassion and mercy. Go and do likewise. In the second scene, Jesus is telling us, pay attention to God's presence and be ready to sit and listen and learn. So we might ask, is walking on the way with Jesus all about rolling up our sleeves and doing things? Or is walking on the way with Jesus all about stopping to sit down and listen and learn? Well, the answer, as with most things that have to do with God, is yes. (laughs) Either way, being on the way with Jesus requires that we pay attention and be aware of when we're supposed to do and when we're supposed to stop and be still and learn. Being on the way with Jesus requires that we surrender our own have to get it done's so that we can learn and do God's will. Or as I like to say at this time every year, what I really need to give up for Lent is myself. Because we believe that in Jesus Christ, God's time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near, we respond in tangible ways, by doing acts of justice and compassion, and by sharing our resources, we bear witness to the good news of the gospel. And so I thank you as you continue to provide gifts so can sustain our ministry here at Concord, whether it's these online services, or you provide funds that we can then pass on to agencies and ministries in the community who help people in deep need. And of course, in the midst of this pandemic and especially the economic impacts of the pandemic, there is such great need. So thank you for your gifts. If you want to continue giving or if you haven't done so before and would like to, you see information there on the screen. We can receive your contributions, whether by mail or there is a way to do so electronically on our website and you see that information there. So thank you for those gifts. All that we do is received and given in gratitude to God.
Please join me in prayer. For your great generosity, O God, for your care for us, we give you thanks. And as we have brought these gifts, we offer them up as a sign not only of our gratitude, but a sign of our desire to be part of your healing work in the world, and that you would use these gifts and use our very lives to be part of that work, to bring renewal, to bring your reign ever near. Because you listen to us, O oh God, and receive not only our praise, but our cries for help, we offer them to you now. From Bethlehem to Nazareth, from Jordan to Jericho, from Bethany to Jerusalem, from then to now, come, Lord Jesus, to heal the sick, to mend the brokenhearted, to comfort the disturbed, to disturb the comfortable, to cleanse the temple, to liberate faith from familiarity and convention. Come, Lord Jesus, to carry the cross, to lead the way, to shoulder the sin of the world and take it away. Come, Lord Jesus. We cry out to you, Lord, for you are our hiding place in times of trouble and you surround us with glad cries of deliverance. We cry out to you, Lord, for all who are hungry, whether hungry for power and glory or hungry for a simple meal. Show the mighty that you alone can satisfy their deepest need and feed the poor from the abundance of your good creation. We cry out to you, especially this day, O oh God, for the people in the southern part of our country recovering from powerful freezing storms, shortage of power. And Lord, pray that you would restore power and bring heat and that you would find ways and people would help each other to stay warm, to stay safe. Remind us again in this of the, the changes we have wrought on this world that you have gifted to us. Make us good stewards, O oh God, of this, this beautiful creation. We cry out to you, Lord, for the church in times of trial, whether we are tested by tempestuous change or we are tempted by the safety of things as they've always been, and we have crouched in the shadow of the status quo. Give us peace, O oh God, when anger and fear threaten to divide us, and disturb and challenge us when we are too comfortable in this world for we know you desire better things for us and for all the world. We cry out to you, Lord, for leaders in high places, whether they are determined to help those who suffer or they are distant and indifferent to the cries of the oppressed. Open their eyes to see your saving power at work, O God, 
and to open their ears to hear your prophet's calls for justice. Lord God, in this Lenten season, as in every season, instruct us in the way we should go, that we may walk with you, and let your steadfast love surround us always. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we ask this, who teaches us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me in our responsive benediction. Where Christ walks, we will follow. Where Christ stumbles, we will stop. Where Christ cries, we will listen. Where Christ suffers, we will hurt. When Christ dies, we will bow our heads in sorrow. When Christ rises again in glory, we will share his endless joy. There is no other way. He is the only way. Go in the grace, peace, and mercy of the Lord.
So looking ahead to opportunities for service, for worship, for fellowship, and um, things that God is up to here at Concord, I'll bring you some of this information uh, as we enter into this Lenten season. First of all, this coming Tuesday, we begin a Lenten adult education opportunity. Uh, it is called uh, Racism in America, the History We Never Learned in School. Uh, it's a six-week series led by Sue Linderman from Westminster Presbyterian in Wilmington. And it is 7 o'clock Tuesday evening starting this week. Uh, you'll join by Zoom. You'll need to register. Go to the website. Um, I know that in the past we've used the same Zoom link for a number of meetings. This is a whole different link, so you'll need that information. You can share that with others. We've shared it with the Presbytery, so we hope you'll join us. 7 to 8 every Tuesday. Uh, Sue will be making presentation, and there will be plenty of time for Q&A as we explore just the history of racism and how deeply embedded it is and continues to be in our own culture. So 7 o'clock. Um, our regular Wednesday morning mug and muffin continues. Wednesday mornings, 10 o'clock through Zoom. You get that information, how to connect each Wednesday. You get it through the connects. Uh, if you don't have that, just give the church office a call or send an email. We can give that to you. We meet from 10 to 11. We spend time sharing prayers, uh, joys and concerns and praying. And then we spend time diving into the text that will be the focus of the sermon for that coming Sunday. So please join us. Uh, finally, just an opportunity, to an invitation if you're interested. I know you heard if you've, you've either gotten the information through the emails and the, the weekly connects or you were there as part of the congregational meeting a couple weeks ago that we are moving to provide opportunities for live streaming uh, that requires some equipment, which uh, we are getting uh, taken care of, but we also need some people to help run that. And so if you'd be interested in learning how to do it, you don't have to, you don't have to be a computer expert, you don't have to be able to write code, um, but uh, if you can help out, we're trying to create about three or four teams, which means it would be a, a Sunday morning commitment for about two hours, about a half hour before worship, half hour after. Um, we train you, provide support, um, and if we get enough teams, we, you don't have to do it like once every three or four weeks. And uh, if you're interested, just contact me. Um, you can get that information on the website, uh, or if you just want to send an email, write to me or to the uh, information, the office uh, email on the website. So love to have you. Uh, it'll be a couple weeks now. The, in, the uh, equipment's going to be installed, and then we'll start training people on it as we get ready to... Uh, to provide live streaming. So that's what's going on right now as we enter this Lenten uh, season. And uh, as you do, as we walk with Jesus, um, just pray that uh, God's uh, joy and peace and guidance would be with you. Peace be with you all.